Good day to you, and thank you for viewing our PowerPoint presentation on the ASP Welfare website. Dr. Beisner and I will be presenting over a decade of research utilizing a network approach in managing large social groups of rhesus macaques at the California National Primate Research Center. And we've been conducting this research as part of a larger program on using network analysis to investigate macaque health and well-being, both as a model for human health and as a means to develop new, proactive, efficacious approaches to captive primate management. And again, as our title indicates, our focus today is on the application of network approaches to captive primate management, and specifically breeding colony management. And our focus has been specifically on the management of these large breeding groups consisting anywhere from 80 to 150 animals in large one half acre enclosures. These groups largely consist of match lines of rhesus macaques, although there is some variation across enclosures on the degree of matrilineal structure. And we know that such social group living consists of both benefits and challenges, where the benefits include the ability to exhibit complex species typical behavior, including dominance interactions, grooming, mating, rearing offspring, obviously foraging behavior, um, and these obviously promote individual health. While the challenges are often associated with the outcome of some of those relationships in the form of physical trauma and stress relating to instabilities in social relationships. And one of the first patterns we noticed is that we not only see variation in aggression and trauma seasonally, as rhesus are seasonal breeders, but also across enclosures in a given season, with some enclosures showing substantially greater amounts of aggression and trauma than others, despite being superficially structured socially quite similarly. We also began to notice, despite common thought, that the amount of aggression, even severe aggression, shows no association with trauma. And furthermore, it is really important to point out that while the risk factors overlap, aggression and or trauma do not always equal social instability. Why? Because aggression is a normal part of macaque social behavior, which serves to maintain social relationships and cohesion. We expect higher rates of, of aggression in breeding season due to mating competition. We also expect variation in aggression across groups due to group size, composition, even the personality mix of group members. Higher rates of overall aggression are not always associated with higher rates of trauma because the purpose and function of aggression matters, as we will soon see. And social overthrows are not always preceded by higher rates of aggression. Sometimes there's a calm before the storm, an avoidance due to uncertainty of the outcome of interactions. Indeed, in a series of perturbation experiments where we, where we either permanently or temporarily removed animals from the social group, we looked at four different types of trauma from six groups, and we found that aggression does not equal trauma because the type of aggression matters. Indeed, aggression showed a positive relationship with trauma in only one study for a single category of trauma, punctures, and in the rest, we found a negative relationship between aggression and trauma, and specifically when the aggression stemmed from the act of policing or third-party intervention where it actually reduces trauma. So where does this leave us if simple rates of aggression cannot help us predict trauma or social instability more generally? Our perspective is that we might need to look beyond such simple rates of behaviors and adopt more sophisticated tools to understand the complexity in these relationships by looking at patterns in relationships over time on a network scale. And this is where social network analysis really thrives because it allows one to not only look at the patterns in relationships, but hidden patterns in relationships because it measures both direct and indirect connections. One example of this, which of many of you may be aware, is the idea of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, where anyone in the world can reach Kevin Bacon in six degrees or less because of the centrality of Kevin in movies and the connectivity of actors in movie networks. And actually this idea of six degrees of separation is really true of any two human, be human beings on this planet. In fact, this was proven in a letter writing campaign way back in the 1960s. And indeed, I suspect currently that we are much less than six degrees of separation, as I said currently, due to the social media and the internet. And so we applied this type of approach to understanding patterns of wounding, social relocations, and social group instability. And in doing so, we found a couple of major pathways that link the relevant risk factors via social network patterns 
to greater or reduced levels of wounding and social relocation. The first major pathway being matriline fragmentation. And the second is policing by males and social power. Let's start with matriline fragmentation. By first defining what it is. Matriline fragmentation is manifested by the degree of relatedness between individuals in a matriline. On the one hand, an unfragmented matriline consists of relationships in which the matriarch is present, mother-daughter connections are intact, and there's a higher average degree of relatedness. On the other hand, a fragmented matriline is one in which the matriarch is absent, connections are via cousins, and there's a lower average degree of relatedness. A result of this lower relatedness is that it leads to social fragmentation, where the number of communities in a grooming network shows a negative relationship with the coefficient of relatedness in a matriline. That is, the lower the relatedness, the more communities, and social fragmenting into a greater number of subgroups. Interestingly, with a greater number of grooming communities in a matriline, we see a higher ratio of severe aggression within as opposed to between matrilines, indicating that severe fighting is going on within matrilines who are not grooming as a cohesive group. This is a higher order pattern of community structure and its origins in matriline fragmentation gave us insight into where we might intervene from a management perspective. That is by reducing matriline fragmentation in these social groups. And we have since conducted perturbation experiments where we actually reduce this fragmentation. And while I do not have time to go into detail today, we did find a reduction in within matriline severe aggression after such removals. And now for the second major pathway, I'll turn the helm over to Dr. Beisner. Thank you. The second major pathway is policing by males and social power. So in the beginning to understand this problem of aggression in social groups, we found that higher rates of trauma are associated with a sex ratio of fewer adult males to adult females, or more adult females to adult males. But not all males are created equal. And the reason is that males are the ones that are responsible for conflict intervention of females, and specifically unrelated males that have high social power. Social power is gained by the receipt of a signal known as the silent bared teeth display during peaceful contexts, or a context in which no conflict occurs. So let's dig a bit deeper and talk a little bit about SBTs. One of the key behavioral networks in understanding social stability is the silent bared teeth signal, which we abbreviate SBT. The SBT involves retracting the lips to expose the teeth, Past research indicates it is homologous to the human smile, although we don't call it smiling in monkeys. In fact, the meaning of the SBT is different across different species of primate. In rhesus macaques, it is sometimes called a fear grimace because many people thought it was an expression of fear, and some still do think that. But work by our research group, as well as by a couple others, indicates that it is a subordination signal. So what is a subordination signal? Well, it's a signal given by a subordinate animal in acknowledgement of their subordinate role in their dominance relationship with the receiver. Although these SBTs are always given by subordinate individuals to dominant individuals, only some dyads use the signal. When many different animals give an SBT to the same individual, acknowledging their subordinate role, this creates a kind of consensus among group members over who has social power. This signaling consensus can be seen in SBT networks, where dominant males, as well as some females, are positioned at the top of a pyramid-shaped network uh, because they are the recipients of the flow of signal pathways from below them. Importantly, males with high social power are the most successful conflict policers. So what is policing? Conflict policing is when a third party intervenes to stop a conflict. And there are two different types. Um, impartial is where the intervener treats all of the participants equally. And partial policing is where the intervener sides with one of the participants. Partial interventions can be further divided. 
um, those that the intervener sides with their kin or to support the hierarchy, and those where the intervener supports non-kin um, against the hierarchy. Conflict policing by individuals with high social power, therefore, represents an internal mechanism for managing conflict within a social group. And notably, we have found that groups with higher rates of policing interventions have lower rates of trauma, including lower rates of total trauma, as well as lower rates of moderate to severe trauma. So what we are beginning to argue is that SBT networks are critical to the integrity of macaque societies. Every stable macaque group that we have studied exhibits an acyclic SBT network like this, where there are no circular relationships, and we see this pyramid-shaped network with multi-level structure that is associated with policing behavior. We looked at the SBT networks in three of our study groups that experienced a social collapse, one of which is shown here. It just so happened that we had data on this group during a stable time period in 2009 and also four months before its collapse in 2011. What we found was that the number of animals participating in the SBT signaling network was dramatically reduced and the former hierarchically tiered structure was gone. This suggested to us that the hierarchical structure of the SBT network is the backbone of macaque society. And we found a similar breakdown of SBT networks in the other two study groups that we had data on prior to their social collapse. A final piece of evidence for the link between network structure and social stability comes from one of our studies on networks and health. For three different social groups, we collected behavioral data and health metrics, including infection with enteric bacteria, Shigella flexneri. We tested two hypotheses for the potential relationship between social connectedness and risk of infection. The first is a classic infectious disease model that says more connections uh, would lead to greater exposure to pathogens and a higher infection risk. The second hypothesis um, is social buffering. Um, which argues that more social connections may buffer an individual against infection by reducing stress that could compromise immune function. What we found was that greater social connectedness was linked with higher Shigella infection risk in the one group that was unstable and later had a social overthrow. Whereas in the other two stable groups, we found the opposite pattern. Greater social connectedness was linked with a lower Shigella infection risk supporting the social buffering hypothesis. What we've shown here is that taking a network analytical approach to social management has given us a much better understanding of aggression and trauma. Aggression doesn't always equal instability and rates of aggression may not be the best metric to predict either wounding or overthrows. We've identified two major pathways for understanding aggression and trauma. Kinship and whether a match line shows fragmentation or cohesion, and males with high social power who police conflicts within the group. And this policing behavior could be mistakenly included in overall aggression rates, and so the purpose of the aggression matters. Finally, uh, peaceful SBTs may be a keystone network in predicting social overthrows. Removal of socially important individuals, such as policers, can disrupt SBT networks and the disintegration of SBT networks appears to lead to social collapse because of the decoupling of the SBT network um, from other networks in the group. There are some potential practical applications for our findings. A proactive approach toward maintaining social stability can involve reducing or preventing matriline fragmentation, adding new unrelated males as conflict policers, and being selective about these males because their personality influences policing success through differential receipt of SBTs. And finally, also monitoring SBT and policing networks in addition to monitoring aggression rates. Um, and here, it's important to consider the balance of costs and benefits of behavioral monitoring and intervention versus the veterinary care that may be required um, as a result from instability. 
It takes a village, and we want to thank all of the staff, interns, graduate students, postdocs, and colleagues that have been a part of this research. Thank you.